Hi there, I'm Dr. Ben Britton. This is section five of the introduction to electron backscatter diffraction. This section is particularly important for anyone who wants to use orientation data themselves. If you are here just to get an overview of EBSD, you may wish to skip to the next section. But if you're going to conduct any experiments yourself or use the data yourself, you are strongly encouraged to, to view this section, to, to have a go yourself and to understand what's being talked about. So this is describing some work that's within a paper. We got so fed up when we were transferring data and samples between research labs. Uh, we wrote a paper to check and calibrate your system, uh, as well as uh, we wrote a series of software codes to verify that you understand the conventions that are present. Uh, we still use the codes regularly to check bits and pieces as we change the problems that we work on. Uh, we run into new hurdles occasionally. Uh, and these are still uh, the, the formalism that's written down in this process uh, is, is very useful, we hope, uh, in here. Uh, the appendix also has a fantastic uh, longer document that goes through a whole range of descriptions uh, that could be very useful for people who are interested in orientation maths. The, the, the caveat or warning of this is that the following is specific to one system that we calibrated, uh, uh, the imperial system, but the methodology or approach is general. So the things you can do to check are general, uh, but any of the specific details about how we choose the origin, etc., that is specific to how we measured uh, this experiment. So coordinate systems, uh, the EBSD experiment has many coordinate systems. So there are coordinate systems within the diffraction pattern. And specifically, there are two frames of reference that we care about here. There is an image coordinate system, so how the pixels are described in the image. And there is the gnomic frame of reference. And the gnomic frame of reference, basically what it does is it puts 0, 0 at effectively the source point position. And it says this, the detector plane is at a distance 1. And so effectively, as you change the detector distance physically, you change the angle subtended, and that is encoded effectively in the gnomic range in X and Y. There is also the crystal to diffraction pattern coordinate system. There is a sample coordinate system. There is a sample to crystal coordinate system switch uh, in this. And there are also representations with regards to pole figures, tensors, and properties that you may have to consider. So we're going to show how we can go from a diffraction pattern, we can verify the diffraction pattern against the sample and the scanning strategy, and we can relate effectively that against the tilt of the sample and the sample coordinate system to the EBSP, the pattern coordinate system that are present in our example case. And we're going to do that effectively ultimately through eventually overlaying features from our crystal onto our diffraction pattern and show that we can get the diffraction pattern reproduced well and we're going to describe some conventions of how we get through those steps. So if we look at our microscope geometry, we're going to have the detector diffraction pattern is where we start. And we're going to start off and say that we effectively are looking from this side. So that's the eyeball. We're going to look from this side. And we're going to say effectively that one convention is that the Z is pointing out of the sample. And so the Z is pointing sort of uh, from the phosphor towards the eyeball as you look at it. We have a tilt axis that tilts us between the detector and the sample. Uh, and so that says that the tilt axis, the x direction for this microscope, is common between the sample tilt and the detector tilt. That says that therefore the z and y will rotate about this x vector that's going into the page, and both of these will form a right-handed set. Conventionally, when we set up the experiment, we tilt the sample effectively to 70 degrees, and so there is a 70 degree angle that's involved here that is effectively that tilt uh, of the rotation of the sample about the tilt axis. There may also be a tilt of the camera, and we effectively say that that is a tilt as described with respect to the electron beam running vertical, uh, and we describe that in this particular example as about 10 degree detector tilt. That will, of course, depend on how the physical setup of your microscope is built. So the conventions that we use, we say that Z points out of the sample. We hopefully have the 2D map is orthogonal, i.e. it's at right angles for X and Y. And we say that X, Y, and Z form a right-handed set. We describe that indexing happens with respect to a reference crystal. We do indexing in the diffraction pattern 
We want to relate this to how the beam is scanned across the sample. And if this is behaving itself, therefore we can relate the crystallography of our diffraction pattern to the features that are seen in our map, such as particular grain boundaries or features. So the question that we want to ask is how do we link the beam scanning directions, i.e. how we move the electron probe across the sample, to the EBSD pattern? A relatively simple case to do is to effectively, in this configuration, it is relatively easy to rotate the sample about the z-axis, do an in-plane rotation of our crystal, which should result in a rotation across our diffraction pattern. If we do this, so we have a, this is a, a deformed single crystal that I've used, uh, a deformed nickel single crystal that has slip bands and uh, effectively fiducial markers or lumps of crot on the surface. But if we rotate this sample, if we rotate this sample in the, in the, in the sample, we rotate effectively, uh, in this example, we're rotating clockwise and we see that the diffraction pattern rotates clockwise with us, i.e. this horizontal band starts to tip downwards. This band starts to move from running near vertical to more horizontal and so effectively it tips upwards and we see this also happening over here and we describe effectively we're going to have the EBSP ergonomic geometry such that we have Y pointing upwards and X pointing horizontal and again we have Z pointing out of the sample. Now the next question is okay so we now at least have the handedness correct. The handedness would basically say are we looking at the back of the image or are we looking at the front of the diffraction pattern. So we're comfortable that we've got the handedness of the rotation of our sample is consistent with the rotation of our diffraction pattern. So the next question is how is the electron beam moving across our sample? To do this we can use a single crystal of silicon and we can effectively scan across a large area piece of single crystal silicon. It's relatively cheap to buy a single crystal wafer sample. And we can look at how the pattern center moves across our diffraction pattern. The pattern center, as we recall, is the shortest distance between the sample and detector. We have chosen to use PCX and the detector distance. Specifically, PCX effectively describes the source point position. If I just go back a little bit, it describes that effectively PCX, how it falls across the camera. The detector distance tells us about the sample to the detector. And effectively, if you're at a lower position on your sample, in a highly tilted configuration, that is closer to the camera. So the detector distance is shorter. If you're on the top of your sample, the detector distance is longer. If you do these measurements and it's extractable, for instance, uh, from uh, the Brooker data that's collected in our example, or you can watch the diffraction pattern. If we look at four points across our map, we can effectively see that this is the detector distance, so this is a long detector distance, this is a short detector distance, and this shows that if we took the data as scanned, the shorter detector distance, which is, sorry, the shorter detector distance, which is in blue, is here. This shorter detector distance is the bottom of our sample in here. The longer detector distance is effectively the top of our sample and it's in here so we're scanning from bottom to top in this example and so that shows that we have y pointing in this direction and y is pointing up the sample in here if we look at the x convention as we move across this, this detector this effectively is the the short x this is the longer x so the pattern is effectively moving uh, from short to long and so effectively we see the x is pointing on our sample on top of the sem it's pointing from right to left and Z is pointing out of the plane of the page. Some of you may ask why have we not used PCY? There is an ambiguity between different software families and whether you count from the top or bottom of the diffraction pattern. So that's why we've used the detected distance instead. Once you've done that, we then need to think about, okay, so we know how features are moving across the diffraction pattern. We now just need to do the last step that's important is to look at how we establish the reference crystal. The reference crystal, we want to link a Cartesian axis system to the crystal axis system 
This is the relationship between x and y to effectively a, b, and c, and specifically also to the reciprocal lattice vectors a star, b star, and c star. In our convention, which is used at least by the Broca system, we say that a, b, and c form a right-handed set. We say that c is parallel to the z, c axis, so the crystal c is pointing along uh, there. b effectively lies in the y, c, z, c plane at an angle uh, alpha to C. Apologies, the fonts are slightly messed up in the, the video version. And B is pointing at an angle beta to C uh, and uh, an angle gamma to B. Oh, that is an alpha, so it is alpha to C. And that's what this shows. So C is pointing along ZC. We have that B is lying effectively in the ZC, YC plane. So we see it's lying effectively between the vector YC and ZC at an angle alpha with respect to ZC. And then uh, the alpha is effectively an angle beta with respect to C and an angle gamma with respect to B. There is a full description of the equations for this that's described in the tutorial paper and the format is written in the PDF in the supplementary data and there are Python and Mac MATLAB scripts coded to construct what we call the structure matrix that does this conversion. Once we've established the crystal frame that enables us to take a crystal described as A, B, and C, and alpha, beta, gamma, into a Cartesian set, and any vectors, crystal planes, or otherwise, back and forth. This means that we can take a random crystal pattern, so this is a, an experimental pattern, and we can effectively project, if we know the crystal orientation, we can project the diffraction pattern and the particular crystal planes that are present with the source point position. We can see that this matches beautifully. We can create the diffraction sphere. We can relate that to the crystal in the detector frame. We can know the relationship between the detector and the sample frame. And we can plot in the sample frame. We can plot effectively so the X and Y are red and green respectively of this. We can plot effectively the pole figure for particular crystal plane families. Uh, and so we can see, for instance, that this crystal is set up that the uh, 100 plane is pointing effectively the normal direction is running here, so it's running normally over here somewhere. And so that's a, a really nice check that things are sort of behaving themselves and it looks kind of sensible. The last issue that can happen effectively is we just want to check that we know which way Z is pointing, and so whether we're effectively considering the out of plane of the sample or the into the sample. This will change effectively how we consider planes uh, in 3D, and it can be very important if you're doing 3D microscopy. This can happen and be really important in cubic crystals. The best way to do this is to have a facet or a crystallographic feature that we know and can link between the sample and scanning frames. For our example, we use the coherent twin in the FCC, so these are the straight grain boundaries that are shown. They are typically sigma 3 or 60 degree about 111 twinning planes. They're related to that ABC, BCA stacking. And effectively, if you plot the plane trace of this and use focused iron beam to look at the subsurface angle, we can check that the plane trace is presented in the right way. Ideally, we also want to check lower symmetry materials to check does the Cartesian to crystal axis, is that consistent and reasonable? For the outer plane testing, this is our fib cross section, so this is the cross section. We have the inclined plane trace, so effectively this green plane boundary should be pointing upwards. So we should have in here that we're effectively going to have that the normal vector is pointing upwards in this segment, and effectively we can have the trace that's running here. The construction is effectively that if you have the normal to this plane, that's running in there, that will give rise to the perpendicular trace. So this line, the green line, if it's behaving itself in color green, that's sort of shown here, we can dash that line that's present on here. And the plane normal should sit on the perpendicular bisector. It should sit perpendicular and specifically, if it's the correct way around, it should be that this is pointing, in an ideal world, it would point to the right. That's right, point from right to left. 
and this is telling us that this, if we're plotting the coordinate system, we have to rotate this whole thing by 180 degrees, such that again, X is pointing in this direction, Y is pointing downwards, and we can now see that relates our sample coordinate system with X and Y, with effectively up here, X and Y, such that now we have that plane normal that is located, and again, if we rotate to 180 degrees, this would now be sitting in the correct location. Uh, we can check this also for the second one in this example. And so the subsurface trace is pointing over there. And so the subsurface trace is over here. And so again, if we rotate this by 180 degrees, it's in the correct location. It's over here. So this is the correct, this is the consistent set that fits our mapping for this example. There are other ways to check this problem, but this is one uh, good example that we think is relatively cheap to access. You can get copper or nickel-based alloys will typically give you these twins, and it's relatively cheap to fib in there. Um, you can also check lower symmetry. So we looked at titanium. We can check consistency, specifically with regards to that, uh, that the B axis, the B direction points along the Y axis is what we do in our convention, uh, following from C pointing vertical. And uh, if we plot this, we can effectively look at the plane traces of the slip bands. Uh, we did this. We can do the plane traces. Uh, we can plot the diffraction patterns. It all behaves itself. We've checked this a few times. Again, the codes to plot each of these different subplots, you can see explicitly how the maths is written down in the uh, MATLAB and Python codes that are presented. And it will even plot the overlay of the bands if you so wish, which could be helpful. So note on consistency, so often it's much easier to check consistency rather than whether something is uh, absolutely correct. And of course the consistency for your material system may be sufficient, but please be careful if you reduce the symmetry of your crystal or in increase the interrogation that you're interested in. And by that I mean, for instance, you're not just looking at the surface plane traces, you're looking at the subsurface inclination of the boundaries. And that's where the 180 degree problem can cause you issues. Some software is internally inconsistent, which frustrates me immensely. We've told people we've got some stuff fixed. Some installs between microscopes are inconsistent, and some users may uncheck boxes that can change and create inconsistencies. So do check back occasionally, and uh, again, do see whether you can effectively simulate a diffraction pattern or the bands for your diffraction pattern, given all those settings. Uh, and you can see how the math follows of whether you understand the conventions that are present in this problem. There are uh, some recommendations. So we established the sampling co coordinate systems. Uh, and so we, we showed this with the silicon wafer. We uh, described the consistent coordinate systems for the detector and specimen through rotation and beam scanning across the silicon. We want to establish the consistent rotation to rotate the sample and compare the features and diffraction pattern motions in this set. We establish the description of the lower symmetry unit cell and we can capture and record diffraction patterns from the crystal and match a sample to a feature such as the slip band. And we can simulate the diffraction patterns for those lower symmetry simulation codes as using the Python or MATLAB examples. We can validate those plane conventions, pole figure use and crystallographic feature analysis by sampling e.g. a 3D microstructure with a specific crystallographic feature such as the uh, 111 alleling twin. And we can compare that crystallographic feature with a microstructural map such as pole figures. If you have low symmetry crystals, uh, that could also be useful for this example. Uh, with that, uh, I suggest you might want to pause, uh, grab a cup of coffee, uh, and we will resume very shortly 